Uh, okay, so uh, in this particular lecture, we will be okay. So in this particular lecture, we'll be talking about uh, uh, some issues in caching in multi-core systems. Uh, so I've been giving. Uh, did, so did you guys read the uh, evicted address filter paper? I think that was one of the assigned readings, or that's what Ono told me. So how many of you actually read the paper? Okay. So uh, I mean, if, if if you guys already know what's going on, uh, then this lecture will be much shorter than uh, the two hours it's supposed to be. Uh, so let's see how fast we go. And I'll also talk about uh, some other issues, uh, some some broader issues uh, in caching uh, and multicore. I understand that uh, in the last lecture, Gennady already spoke about uh, utility-based cache partitioning, uh, cache compression, and things like that. So uh, I'll try to augment uh, some of those things uh, towards the later part of this lecture as well. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, what, 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 are, what are the general problems in uh, multi-core caching? So there are uh, two aspects to it as sh uh, shown in this slide. So the first aspect is managing uh, individual, individual blocks uh, that are present in the cache. So in this, in this particular slide, I, I list three kinds of blocks uh, that are typically stored in uh, modern uh, caches. The, one is, uh, the first one is blocks that are demand fetched by uh, applications. Right? These are blocks that are uh, regularly accessed by applications and uh, that they perform some computation on. And the second kind of blocks that are also stored in uh, uh, modern caches is prefetch blocks. So you, you have hardware prefetches that constantly keep prefetching data. Oh, oops. Can I put it here? Okay. So uh, yeah, you have uh, hardware prefetches that keep prefetching data into uh, these caches. And the idea behind prefetching is to reduce the latency of accessing uh, blocks that are likely to be accessed by uh, the application in the future. Uh, so did, did Onur talk about uh, prefetching yet? Prefetching algorithms, uh, state of the art, no, okay. Uh, anyway, so and the third kind of uh, blocks uh, that I list here is, are, are dirty blocks, right? So in modern systems you have uh, a hierarchy of caches. You have level one caches, level two, most modern processes have a, a level three cache as well. And you, so the last level cache is kind of used to store these dirty blocks that are evicted from uh, the L1 and uh, L2 caches as well. So the question is, how do you manage these uh, three uh, kinds of blocks in an effective manner? So that's, that's, that's the first uh, uh, question that you'd like to answer uh, uh, regarding caching. And uh, with, with the presence of uh, multiple cores on a single chip, there's this issue of application awareness as well. Right? So when multiple applications are uh, running in the system and they are, when they are sharing the cache, how do you handle the contention for the space uh, from these uh, applications? So different applications may have different requirements uh, for cache space and uh, uh, they can interfere with each other. So how do you, so there can be performance issues, there can be fairness issues, right? So some applications can get starved, they may not get any cache space at all. So how do you address these problems? So uh, let's, 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 so there are, there are two parts of the lecture. Uh, the first part will be regarding this and the second part will be regarding the application awareness part. So uh, part one. So how do you, how do you manage uh, demand uh, fetched uh, blocks uh, that are stored in the last level cache? And, so this was one question that I was trying to answer for the past uh, three years. So the evicted address uh, filter paper that you guys read, uh, I tried to submit it to three different uh, conferences, uh, every time claiming that I'm solving a different problem. But the, fi the final solution was actually the same. So what is the reason, what is the reason for that? So let's, let's, let's look at uh, cache management policy in general. Right? So you have a bunch of blocks uh, in the cache, and the cache management policy can be divided into three uh, component policies. So the first policy is the cache replacement policy, which is basically a, a, an ordering, a priority scheme uh, that determines how the blocks in the cache are ordered. Right? So in this case, if you, have a, if you have the traditional LRU policy, it orders the blocks based on how recently they were accessed. So there is this most recently accessed block, and on the other end is the most least recently accessed block, uh, and you have uh, all the other blocks uh, ordered based on this priority scheme. Right? And 
The second uh, component of the cache management policy is the cache insertion policy, which tries to ask the question, okay, on a cache miss, where should I insert the block? Right? I can, you can imagine I can insert the block at the uh, MRU position, or I can insert the block at the LRU position. Now, it's clear that the replacement policy is going to evict the block at the LRU position, because that's what the replacement policy does. Right? It evicts the block with the lowest priority. But uh, there's, there's an incoming block. Where do I insert it? Right? So do I insert it here? Do I insert it here? Do I insert it somewhere in between? Uh, there are a lot of options. And the third component policy is called the uh, promotion policy, which again asks the question, OK, on a cache hit, what should I do? Right? On a cache hit, you can imagine I can promote the block uh, uh, to the uh, MRU position. I can promote the block to the next location. I can actually de-promote the block. I can do a whole lot of things. Right? So what should I do uh, for the cache promotion policy? So as I was saying, uh, when I first wrote the uh, EAF paper, uh, I was saying, oh, it's a cache management policy. Right? Now, when you, when you say cache management policy, people can, think, people can think a whole lot of things. Right? They can say, oh, you're solving uh, replacement. Uh, you're solving insertion. Oh, you're solving all three of them. Right? So based on what they think you're solving, they list a bunch of uh, related works that you have to compare to and uh, 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 implement and things like that. Right? So as I... Uh, began to understand these issues more clearly, I finally found that uh, what the evicted address filter paper was trying to solve was uh, a better cache insertion policy. Right? So, that's the, uh, so I've actually given uh, the same lecture uh, to three different classes uh, saying I'm solving three different problems. Right? Uh, the, in the first lecture, it was solving uh, shared cache uh, management. And in the next paper, it was uh, uh, cache management. And now it's cache insertion. Right? So, yeah, it, so what it really solves is cache insertion. Anyway. So, uh, so let's, let's look at what, so once you fix the replacement policy, as you can see in, uh, from, from the slide, uh, the insertion policy and the promotion policy kind of determine how long uh, a block that has just been accessed will stay in the cache, right? So on a cache miss, so if an access misses in the cache, the insertion policy is going to determine how long it's going to stay in the cache. If you insert it at the MRA position, it is going to get a long time uh, before it gets evicted. So uh, if the block is going to be reused, uh, it has a potential uh, to be reused while it's in the cache. On the other hand, if you insert at the LRU position, it will get evicted uh, quickly. So similarly, the promotion policy determines what happens uh, when an access hits in the cache. Right? If it, once, once an access hits in the cache, depending on to which location you promote it to, it determines how long it's going to stay in the cache. So uh, these two policies, so once you fix the replacement policy, these two policies kind of determine uh, how long a block stays in the cache after it has been accessed. Uh, right? So what does uh, the traditional uh, LRU policy do? Right? So uh, the insertion policy of uh, LRU is insert all blocks at uh, the MRU position. Right? And, the, and the rationale behind this is if a block is accessed, it is likely to be accessed again. Right? So there will be more access to the block. So putting it at the MRU position will likely lead to uh, cache hits. That's the uh, idea behind uh, the traditional LRU policy's insertion component. And the promotion policy is, again, a promote to MRU on a cache hit. Right? Again, the rationale behind this is if a block is reused, it is likely to be reused again. Right? Now, uh, if you look at uh, prior work, they have not questioned the promotion policy as much. Right? So the promotion policy, the rationale behind the promotion policy has kind of worked for almost all the uh, 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 works that have been done by uh, uh, prior papers. Right? So the, the, the idea. The idea that uh, if, if you reuse a block, you're likely to reuse the block again is kind of uh, agreed. Right? So there have been papers which, uh, which, which discussed how much you should promote a block. You should, should you promote it to the MRU position? Can you just promote it by uh, one step instead of just directly promoting it to MRU? People have uh, uh, discussed this a lot, but they have, not, they have not really questioned this rationale. But the insertion policy has been uh, widely questioned and uh, discussed and researched upon. And what is the reason, right? So let's let's. So what do you, what, what are some problems with uh, LRU's uh, insertion policy? So uh, people who have read the EF paper would probably know. The, yeah, cash Joe, pollution. cash cash pollution. Uh, okay, uh, you you want to say something? No, the big one. I guess cash thrashing is also cash thrashing. Okay, so uh, can can you guys go uh, one level deeper? I mean, yeah, sure. So say you insert a block using just LRU and you insert it at the most recently used position, uh, that block, if it's not used again, has to take 16 evictions to get, or however many points in the stack okay. 
to get pushed out. So if it's not useful, then it's sitting there taking up space for more useful blocks. Okay, okay. So you want to go into flashing a bit more? Sure. If there's different workloads that are that are that are both useful, then one workload is, is getting is jumping out the other workload. Okay. Uh, but that kind of seems like the same uh, problem, right? As in, so the, the problem, so you have just uh, expanded the problem to multi-core systems, right? So in a multi-core system, uh, so what, what Joe was mentioning was, okay, in a, in a, in a, I mean, irrespective of which applications the blocks are accessed, uh, if a block is not used, it can just stay in the cache for a long time. So you, what you said can be extended to multi-core system. One core is accessing uh, blocks that are not used. Other core is uh, reusing a lot of its blocks. But now if you follow the, uh, traditional LRUs insertion policy, the uh, blocks of the former application are going to evict the blocks of the later application. Right? So it's, it's kind of the same problem. So cache thrashing, anyone? So the last time I was handling a lecture uh, uh, to a class, uh, Jimmy was sitting in that lecture and he told me that uh, in a class, if you uh, generally ask a question, what is two plus two, uh, people wouldn't answer. Right, so it's, there is always uh, this embarrassment factor to answer a question. So here it seems like you're also uh, recorded. Uh, so I think the inertia is going to be only higher. Uh, ben, what is cache thrashing? It's okay. <laughs> so uh, okay, so that's right. I mean, cache pollution and cache thrashing are uh, two problems with uh, uh, LRU's uh, insertion policy. So as 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 Joe mentioned, cache pollution is uh, blocks maybe accessed only once, right? So an application can touch a block, it will not access it again. Uh, uh, examples, so people have used again this word called scans. I mean, uh, you have a really large data structure and you just scan through the data structure, you're probably searching for a, a specific key uh, in a table or something like that. And uh, after you're done with the scan, uh, you are done with the data structure. You're, you're, not, you're no longer concerned with it. So uh, when blocks are accessed only once, inserting them at MRU, it's going to stay in the cache for a long time before it gets evicted. Uh, not, a, not, not, a, not a good policy. Cache thrashing, uh, so blocks may be reused. I mean, it, it, it may not be the case that they are accessed only once, but if there are a lot of blocks that are going to be reused, now they're going to evict each other from the cache, right? So inserting everything at the MRE position, they're go just going to keep eviting each other, and uh, uh, that's called cache thrashing. So one example of that is a large working set, right? So uh, a single application uh, having a large working set larger than the cache, so it, it causes thrashing. Uh, in a multi-core system, you can imagine multiple applications. Each one may have a, a working set that actually fits into the cache, uh, but when, when, when all of them are put together, the combined working set kind of uh, exceeds the cache size, and as a result, uh, uh, you have thrashing. So, uh, so how do we address, address these two problems? I mean, so we need to, so that's what prior work has uh, primarily focused on, uh, how to address cache pollution, how to address cache thrashing. So to address cache uh, pollution, uh, one uh, uh, approach that has been uh, highly used by uh, prior work is, to, is, is this idea of reuse prediction. Right? So on a cache miss, you predict whether the missed cache block has uh, high reuse or low reuse. And uh, uh, if the block has high reuse, you insert it at the MRE position. Uh, if the block has uh, low reuse, you insert it at the LRE position. Now, uh, doing this can... Uh, mitigate uh, the effect of pollution because low reuse blocks will now be evicted from the cache quickly, whereas uh, high reuse blocks will uh, be held in the cache for a long time, uh, uh, leading to a likely cache hit, right? So, uh, so how, do we, how do we keep track of this? Uh, how do we do this prediction? So one, one way uh, to do that would be to keep track of the reuse period of every single cache block in the system. So uh, for every block uh, you have in uh, memory, you have a bit saying, okay, the last time this block was accessed, was it reused or not? Uh, one, one possible approach, right? but clearly uh, impractical uh, because I mean, uh, such a structure is going to be huge. Uh, it's going to take a long time to uh, look up that structure. You, you're probably better off accessing the uh, block from memory uh, instead of looking at this structure. Right? So, so what, is, what has prior work done? So, uh, so there is this general approach of uh, using uh, uh, the program counter or uh, the memory region information. So you, I, I assume you guys know about branch prediction. Right, so uh, so the branch prediction problem is okay. On a when I when I hit a branch, uh, do I uh, uh, take the branch or do I not take the branch? And people have shown that the program counter information can actually, I mean, past behavior of the program counter can actually be uh, useful to predict uh, uh, which way the branch is going to go. And 
people have used a similar approach for reuse prediction. Right? So you can imagine a single program counter accessing a, a large set of blocks, and uh, uh, depending on what happened to the blocks that are accessed by the program counter in the past, you may be able to predict what's going to happen uh, to the blocks that are accessed by the program counter in the future. Right? So that's, that's the idea here. So there are three steps uh, in this process. The first step is to uh, group blocks uh, based on, so in this case, you can either use the program counter or uh, the memory region. So memory region is, uh, you can again uh, split your memory into large regions, uh, uh, one kilobyte, two kilobyte, or something like that, and then learn uh, the behavior of what happens to blocks within those memory regions, right? So you use, the first step is to group the blocks based on some factor. So let's let's assume that we group the blocks based on the program counter. So here you have PC1 and PC2, and then you learn the behavior of the program counter based on what happens to blocks that are accessed by the program counter in the past. So in this case, you learn that, oh, A was reused, B was also reused, so I'm going to assume that all the blocks that are accessed by program counter 1 are going to be reused. On the other hand, uh, uh, program counter 2 access blocks S and T, and they are not, uh, they are both not reused. So I'm going to assume that all the blocks that are accessed by program counter 2 in the future are also not going to be reused. And the final step is just use, the, use whatever you have learned to predict the reuse behavior of uh, blocks that are accessed in the future. Right? So in this case, you'll say, oh, OK, if C is accessed by program counter 1, I'm going to say it's a, it has high reuse. Uh, on the other hand, if, if a block U is accessed by program counter 2, I'm going to say it has uh, low reuse. Right. And uh, there has been, so I've listed three uh, prior works which actually used uh, such approaches. So runtime cache bypassing uh, uh, was from Teresa Johnson uh, in ISCA 97. And the idea behind runtime cache, cache bypassing was to use a table of counters. I mean, basically it groups blocks based on uh, the memory region. And uh, uh, in fact, it, it, it did more than uh, uh, just cache insertion policy. It said, OK, I'm going to compare the reuse behavior of the block that is going to get evicted and uh, the reuse behavior of the block that is going to be inserted. Right? So it's, it's, not, it's not just uh, testing uh, for reuse. It's more than just testing for reuse. You compare the uh, reuse behaviors of the two blocks. And uh, if the reuse level of the block that is getting evicted is more than the reuse, behavior, reuse level of the block that is get, getting inserted, you just bypass the block. So that was, that was runtime uh, bypassing. So single usage block prediction and uh, signature-based hit prediction uh, both uh, uh, so single usage block prediction used the program counter based uh, uh, approach uh, for for prediction and uh, signature based hit prediction kind of used both both these approaches. I mean, they, uh, it, it it was the paper compared uh, how well the program counter based approach and the memory uh, region based approach uh, work. Right. So this was this was kind of prior work uh, and. Uh, uh, so, so what, what, what did we do in uh, uh, evicted address filters? So before going to that, uh, do any of you find some drawbacks uh, with these approaches? I mean, what, what, what could go wrong here? Yeah. It's not very precise. The, the group, group behavior is not necessarily a good indication of per block behavior. Okay. So, so uh, yeah, that's a good that's that's a good point, right? So you you can have uh, so let's say uh, one program counter just uh, scanned a structure and then uh, uh, identified certain blocks, uh, and uh, a second program counter came and uh, reused a, a few of those blocks, right? Uh, now it's not clear uh, which program counter uh, behavior should I use. Uh, it, it, so it, there, there's there's generally this problem of uh, the group behavior may not. Uh, imply per block behavior. Uh, any other problems? OK, so let's, let's, let's get to the other problems later. Okay. So the group behavior may not imply uh, per block behavior. So uh, what can we do? So the idea behind uh, uh, evicted address filters was to use a per block prediction. So to predict the reuse behavior of a single block, you use the block's uh, past uh, behavior to uh, do that. So uh, what was the idea? The idea was to use how recently was a block evicted uh, to predict its reuse behavior of the next access? Right? So let's, let's quickly go into the idea. So once a block gets evicted, if it is accessed soon after eviction, then uh, EAF says this block was prematurely evicted from the cache. So I'm actually going to uh, 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 predict that the block has high reuse so that uh, the next time it's not prematurely evicted. On the other hand, if a block is accessed after a long time uh, uh, after eviction, then uh, EAF is going to predict that uh, the block has low reuse uh, because even though even if I insert the block with a high priority into the cache, uh, it is unlikely to be reused because it, it took so long, uh, at least so long to get reused. 
So the next uh, uh, access to the block uh, may not actually hit in the cache. So inserting the block with a high priority may not make sense. So, uh, so what, what this observation suggests is it's, it's sufficient to keep track of a, a small uh, set of recently evicted blocks. You don't have to keep track of uh, every single block in the system. You just need to say, OK, which blocks were recently evicted from the cache? And you can kind of use that to predict uh, high reuse blocks and uh, uh, low reuse blocks, right? So, uh, so let's so the the based on this idea, the idea uh, the uh, you know, e, the uh, mechanism actually augments the cache uh, with a structure called EAF, which is evicted address filter, and it keeps track of uh, some recently evicted uh, uh, block addresses. And uh, when a block gets evicted from the cache, you insert the address into the EAF, and on a cache miss. Uh, you test if the address is present in the EAF or not. So if it is present in the EAF, you conclude that the block has a high reuse, prematurely evicted high reuse inside at the MRE position. On the other hand, if the block address is not present in the uh, EAF, then you say, OK, uh, I'm going to predict that the block has low reuse and insert it at the LRE position. Right. So this was, this, so this, this was uh, the simple uh, idea behind uh, uh, the reuse prediction component of the evicted address filter. So now, uh, now that I have presented some ideas on how uh, you can predict reuse and thereby uh, mitigate uh, pollution, uh, let's, let's, let's get into the thrashing problem. Right? Uh, so again, I said cache. I mean, I should have animated some of, it, some of these slides. Uh, uh, generally, owner likes to ask questions uh, before he animates stuff. Right? But anyway, the answers are, answers are here. So, to, so again, so if, you, if you go and look at uh, uh, cache thrashing, uh, again, as, as we mentioned before, Thrashing occurs when the uh, working set is larger than the cache size. And in such a case, if you just insert all the blocks at the MRE position, uh, they're going to evict each other. So prior work uh, proposed this idea of uh, using the bimodal insertion policy, uh, which was, uh, as, as it says, they're inserted at MRE with a low probability and inserted at LRE with a high probability. So what happens in this case? So when you access a large working set, a portion of the working set gets a small fraction of the working set gets inserted at the MRE position, and uh, uh, it kind of it kind of stays stays there. The remaining uh, blocks are inserted at the LRE position, and they get evicted. So you you can retain a fraction of the uh, working set uh, in the cache. That's the benefit. And uh, there have been a bunch of so the the original idea of the bimodal insertion policy was proposed by uh, Moin Qureshi in uh, his paper on adaptive insertion policies uh, for high performance caching. And uh, uh, Amir Jalil, uh, ex uh, sorry, who was an author on this paper as well, uh, expanded this uh, uh, idea to uh, multiple cores. Uh, how do you manage shared caches using uh, this dynamic insertion policy? And uh, later, uh, he proposed a different uh, cache replacement policy. So again, as I said, you can just modify the cache replacement policy and choose uh, uh, this, these high-level insertion policies. Uh, 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 on top of those replacement policies, right? So what uh, this ISCA paper did was it proposed a new uh, cache replacement policy, and it applied uh, the bimodal insertion policy on top of that, right? So, okay. So, but uh, our goal is not to address just uh, pollution or thrashing, right? Our goal is to address pollution and uh, thrashing. So uh, how do how how do we go about uh, how, how how do we do that? So can we just combine uh, the two approaches? I mean, we have studied uh, mechanisms to address pollution. We have studied mechanisms to address thrashing. Uh, can we just combine them? Uh, any ideas? What are the what are what are okay? What are some problems with combining the two approaches? Just think about it. I mean, so what? So again, so let let so let me help you guys here, right? So for uh, for addressing pollution, he said predict the uh, reuse behavior on a cache miss. Uh, insert high reuse blocks at MRU and low reuse blocks at LRU, right? And uh, for thrashing, we said again, uh, uh, what what those works did was you determine whether the whether the working set is thrashing or not, and if the working set is thrashing you use the bimodal insertion policy for all the blocks so that uh, a fraction of the working set is there in the cache. If it is not thrashing, then just follow uh, the traditional LRU policy. So this is, these, these are the two high level approaches to address uh, pollution and to address thrashing. And now the question is, oh, can we just, uh, combine, can't we just combine the two approaches to address both problems? So yeah. I was going to say that it's possible that you would, uh, you predict every single block you're inserting is a high priority block. Mm -hmm. and Still, 
that's a that's a good point, right? Uh, so uh, this was kind of the second uh, drawback uh, of uh, the mechanisms, uh, the initial the program counter based mechanisms and the EAF approach that that I uh, described. Uh, so there is no uh, explicit control on how many blocks are going to get predicted to have high reuse, right? So if I just combine these two approaches and let's say uh, my mechanisms predict uh, all the blocks to have high reuse, now they they're all going to get inserted with a high priority into the cache. Uh, and I mean that's what that's what the uh, mechanism status pollution said. Now that's going to lead to thrashing because uh, if, the, if the cache cannot handle all your highly used blocks, uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, going to work, right? So, so clearly uh, uh, combining the two approaches is not straightforward. I mean partly because they are both using the same uh, component, right? They're both using the cache insertion policy to uh, address pollution or thrashing. So if you want to just combine them uh, together, uh, it, it's not it's not clear uh, how uh, you would go about doing that, right? So, uh, any any ideas? Yeah. So if the like if, if the reuse uh, probability of a kit can like matches the inserted one, uh, then you could probably use the probability thing. Like, uh, don't insert it always at the same position and make it less probability. Okay, so I, I didn't quite understand that. Okay, thing. so thrashing, if thrashing is occurring, uh, if we don't, we, uh, if, so if the working data site it is thrashing this, then what will happen is you will have the evicted data line, same uh, same uh, replacement, uh, same reuse probability okay. as the one which is being inserted. Okay. So in the, if they match a lot, then okay. you can kind of get an idea that if this is a thrashing based behavior. Okay. And then you can Okay, so so the the idea is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in in the runtime cache bypassing work, what it did was you compare the uh, reuse levels of the blocks that is getting inserted and the block that is getting evicted, and uh, if one depending on which one is greater, you retain that block in the cache and you just bypass the other block. Now uh, his suggestion is, if the reuse levels are uh, similar, then uh, it it may be an indication of uh, cache thrashing, and uh, you can uh, use that information to uh, uh, switch to a thrash resistant policy. Now, uh, uh, so some some immediate questions that come to my mind is now, how do you how do you track the reuse level? So the the way these mechanisms track the reuse level is uh, how many times did the block receive hits while it was in the cache, right? Now by mitigating thrashing, you're ensuring that blocks that are there in the cache uh, are going to get some uh, hits. So you you're you're kind of going into a stuck state. Where blocks in the cache will always have a high reuse level than blocks are coming in. Right? That is one problem. The other problem is, as I said, the runtime cache bypassing work. Uh, it used the memory region uh, uh, as a as an indicator of reuse. Right. So I, I look at a large memory region, probably a one kilobyte region, uh, to uh, determine the reuse behavior of individual blocks in that region. Right. So it's not a single block. So for all you know, uh, if the working set is thrashing, the incoming block and uh, the outgoing block may always belong to the same region. Right, so uh, you may you may always uh, predict that the working set is thrashing in that case, right? So it's not it's not clear. So but that's a that's a uh, uh, interesting way of looking at the problem. So you can yeah, okay. So uh, without uh, much ado, I'll just go into uh, the solution. So what we found was uh, implementing EAF using a, a Bloom filter uh, kind of addresses uh, both problems. So uh, how, how many of you know about a Bloom filter? Uh, just so every, everyone knows about a Bloom filter. Okay, so I'm going to just then uh, skip this guy, right? So, so you guys all know about false positives and uh, uh, the fact that you cannot remove elements from the Bloom filter. You can clear stuff. Okay. So, uh, so we would like to implement the EAF using a Bloom filter. Now, uh, so before before looking at how you would do that, let's look at the Operations that we perform on the Bloom filter quickly. Right? So, uh, when a block address get, gets evicted from the cache, we insert the block address into the EAF. On a cache miss, we test uh, if the missed block address is present in the EAF, and uh, if it is present, we remove uh, it from the EAF to create space for more 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 blocks. And uh, when the EAF is full, you have to remove an address uh, from the uh, from it to ensure that more uh, evicted blocks can be inserted. So again, you remove an address in a FIFO fashion. Right now, we would like to insert it. I mean, we would like to implement EAF using a Bloom filter. So, uh, as we, as we as 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 you guys know, the Bloom filter 
supports the insert and the test operations, but it does not support uh, these two remove operations. So we need to get rid of these remove operations to uh, ensure that EAF can be implemented using a Bloom filter. So we proposed two changes. The first change was to uh, not perform uh, uh, the remove uh, when a misblock address is present in the EAF. And the second change was uh, when the EAF becomes full, uh, you clear, clear it completely uh, instead of removing uh, a block address in a FIFO manner. So let's look at how these two changes actually uh, lead to uh, the thrashing mitigation property of uh, EAF, right? So again, uh, uh, thrashing happens when the working set of the cache is uh, larger than the, I mean, working set is larger than the cache size, and there are two cases uh, in the context of EAF. So the first case is, uh, why is it uh, animating on its phone? Okay, so PowerPoint chose to, it's choosing to animate on its own. Do you guys know why? Did I press some button? Anyway, I think it seems to have stopped. Okay. Uh, so the two cases are uh, when the working set is uh, larger than the cache but smaller than the cache and the EAF put together, and the second case is when the working set is larger than both the cache and the uh, EAF put together. So let's look at the first case. Uh, so as we know, the traditional LRU policy will uh, lead to thrashing uh, in this case. Uh, I mean, assuming that the, okay, it's still animating on its own. Does anyone know why? Okay. Maybe I should I should talk faster than the animation so that. <laughs> <laughs> I overtake it. Anyway, so uh, the traditional LRE policy in this case, so when, when the access sequence, uh, so if you, if you access this uh, working set in a cyclic manner, it's clear that the traditional LRE policy will lead to uh, thrashing. But let's look at how the uh, naive, how the naive EAF based approach would uh, uh, mitigate thrashing in this case, right? So uh, when, when, when block A is accessed, uh, it is going to miss in the cache. Uh, but it is present in the EAF, so it will it'll be predicted to have high reuse. Uh, you insert it with a high priority into the cache. Now, when you access block B, again, uh, it misses in the cache, predicted to have high reuse, uh, inserted into the cache with high priority. In fact, the same thing will happen to all the blocks. Right? So every, every block is going to predict it to have uh, high reuse and insert with a high priority into the cache. Yeah. We are assuming these belong to the same set. Yeah, so, yeah. so in this case, uh, we assume that uh, all these blocks belong to the same cache set. So this is a single set of the cache. Uh, you, can, you can just extend it to a set associated cache, right? Where the same thing happens with each uh, this thing. So, okay. So let's look at how the Bloom filter based approach would perform, right? So we propose two changes uh, uh, to the mechanism. So, so again, in this case, when block A is accessed, it will miss in the cache. It is present in the EAF. It is predicted to have high reuse, inserted with a high priority into the cache. But notice that the block uh, address is not removed, right? So the EAF still retains uh, the block address. So uh, when, when block B is accessed, the same thing happens, uh, inserted with a high priority, but again, the block address is not removed. So till the access to block D, uh, which also misses in the cache, it's also inserted with a high priority, but at this point, the EAF becomes full, right? And uh, as we uh, mentioned, one of the changes we do is when the EAF becomes full, you go and clear the EAF completely. So in this case, the, man, I lost the punch. <laughs> anyway, okay, so EAF is completely cleared, so the next four accesses to EFGH, although they miss in the cache, uh, notice that they are not present in the EAF, right? So they are all inserted with a uh, low priority into the cache at the LRE position, and therefore they evict only block I from the cache, right? So the other uh, blocks are retained in the cache. So in the next uh, uh, eight accesses in the sequence, uh, only block I will miss. The other blocks will actually hit in the cache, right? So if you uh, if you can if you imagine uh, this access sequence. Uh, repeating itself, uh, then uh, e e the EAF implementation using Bloom filter will actually lead to cache hits for a small fraction of the blocks uh, instead of cache misses for almost all the blocks, like tr the traditional policy or the naive policy. Right? So we, f we, we find that the Bloom filter based EAF approach actually mitigates uh, thrashing. Right? So, uh, what, so let's, look, let's look at the second uh, case uh, of the large working set uh, for the sake of completion. So in this case, the working set is uh, larger than the uh, cache and the EAF, so all blocks are uh, predicted to have low reuse, uh, irrespective of the implementation of the EAF. 
Man, so looks like PowerPoint is faster than me. <laughs> okay, so however, you'd like to allow a small uh, fraction of the uh, working set to stay in the cache, uh, so as, so that you can receive cache hits for at least that small fraction. And uh, uh, how would we do that? Uh, let's see if you can get the answer before PowerPoint chooses to animate that thing. <laughs> Anyone? Oh, it came. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we just leveraged uh, prior work in this case, uh, right? I mean, you, uh, all blocks are, have low reuse, so you can just use the bimodal insertion policy uh, for uh, low reuse blocks. So a, f a small fraction of them will get inserted at the MR position, and then you'll have cache hits for that fraction. So this slide uh, shows the uh, summary of uh, the results uh, of our experiments comparing EAF with uh, the other prior approaches that I mentioned. And as you can see, uh, the EAF based approaches. Uh, so there's actually two. The, 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 the DEAF part is uh, a mechanism that uses uh, this idea of set dueling to uh, compare uh, EAF with the traditional LRU policy. And if the traditional LRU policy performs better, it uses that policy. So uh, as you can see, uh, EAF and DEAF both uh, outperform prior approaches significantly. Uh, uh, that's what I would say in a conference talk. <laughs> OK. So. <laughs> So one question uh, that I can possibly throw out here is so the x-axis here shows the number of cores. Right? So one core, two core, four core. And as you can see, uh, the, the single core performance uh, is very similar to some of the prior approaches. On the other hand, the multi-core performance uh, is uh, significantly higher. Uh, do you guys have any uh, thoughts on that? Uh, why, why might that be the case? I think you guys would know the answer if uh, from yesterday's lecture. Why? Compression works well for multi cores than single core. Okay. Seems like uh, uh, if I ask what 2 plus 2 is, no one would answer. You're right. <laughs> anyway, so, so again, so th this is one uh, issue that is, uh, that is more relevant uh, in a multi core system. Uh, right. I mean, so let's say I have an application that has that is just streaming. Right. That there's, there's a large, uh, uh, let's say, uh, it is accessing a hundred megabyte data structure and just scanning through the data structure. Now, clearly, uh, an on-chip cache that is uh, a few megabytes in size is not going to benefit this application at all. Now, let's say I employed EAF for that particular application. Right. So it's it's accessing a hundred megabyte data structure, and I use EAF, and EAF determines that oh, this application is thrashing. So I'm going to keep uh, one megabyte of those 100 megabytes into the cache, and the remaining things uh, will be evicted without, uh, by getting inside of the LRU position. Do you think it will improve performance for the application? Mm. One megabyte in cache, 99 megabytes from memory, uh, versus 100 megabytes in memory. What do you think is the performance difference? Do you expect performance improvement? Yes, no. You expect performance improvement. OK, so one megabyte in cache, 99 megabytes in main memory, uh, versus 100 megabytes in main memory. Uh, do you expect significant improvement in performance for this application? Yes, no. Just, just say, say, guys, please. Significant, no. Some, yes. Right? So that's, that's really this. So in a single core system, if you have a lot of applications that are just doing nothing but uh, accessing low reuse blocks, you cannot expect significant performance improvements for those applications. Right? On the other hand, let's say I took this uh, uh, application that is accessing this, uh, these 100 megabytes, and there's this other application uh, which has uh, uh, a working set of 512 kilobytes. Right? Uh, and let's say you apply the traditional LRU policy for this application, uh, for, for this, these two applications. Now, uh, the traditional LRU policy is going to just evict everything from the cache. Right? So the 100 megabytes evict these 512 kilobytes also from the, from the cache. On the other hand, if you applied a policy like uh, uh, EAF, uh, or even these other policies, as you can see, they improve performance significantly for uh, multi-core than single core. Uh, the, the pollution or thrashing caused by uh, one application is affecting the, uh, affecting the other applications as well. And that's really what these mechanisms uh, prevent in multi-core. And that's why many of the mechanisms, so these problems uh, become uh, significant in a multi-core system, and uh, solutions that you propose also uh, kind of improve uh, performance significantly for uh, multi-core systems. Right? So that's that's kind of the takeaway from uh, the slide. 
uh, in general. And I think you, you might have seen the same thing uh, with compression as well, right? So when you employed cache compression for a, uh, for a single core system, uh, the performance improvement was uh, around uh, uh, four or five percent. But the moment you go to uh, multi-core systems, uh, compressing data of uh, one application, even though it may not benefit that application, it creates more space for uh, some other application to uh, store its data. So uh, these problems actually become more relevant in uh, multi-core systems. So that's kind of the takeaway here. Okay. So that's the uh, end of part one. So uh, part two, how do you uh, manage uh, prefetched blocks? So we saw how we manage demand-fetched blocks till now. How do you manage uh, prefetched blocks? Uh, I'm not going to answer this question in this, in this lecture because I'm actually working on a problem. Uh, I think Samihan is helping me with that. So uh, I, I'm not sure if I know the answers to the, to the questions here. So uh, we are it's still research in progress. So hopefully in a future course. Managing uh, dirty blocks. Again, uh, if you guys had uh, seen, through the, uh, seen through some of the problems that I gave for potential projects, uh, you would know that I don't know the answer to this question as well. So <laughs> it's also a future, future course. Hopefully I have a paper and one who says, oh, go and teach this in the class or something like that. Okay, application awareness. Again, I haven't done much here. Uh, I'm just going to tell you what uh, prior work did. So, there, so prior work has looked at uh, uh, incorporating application awareness into uh, cash management, right? So, so okay. Uh, I think maybe yeah, I can just show this. So, the, 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 goal, the goal here is to uh, improve uh, performance. So again, as I said, multi-core systems, different applications, content for uh, cache space, and uh, you want to mitigate this interference or somehow reduce the interference to uh, improve. So okay, your goal can be to improve performance. Your goal can be to improve uh, fairness, uh, maybe both. Uh, and what prior works have suggested is to use uh, cache partitioning to uh, achieve these goals, right? So the, the goal behind partitioning was, so you have a partitioning algorithm uh, or a partitioning policy that determines how should you divide the cache space between the applications that are running on the system uh, to achieve one of these goals. So your goal can be uh, high performance or your goal can be high fairness. Uh, how do you partition the cache between the applications, right? And uh, there's a partitioning uh, enforcement scheme which says, okay, if this is the uh, partitioning policy, how do I go and enforce uh, these partitioning algorithms? And, uh, and, and the, di the, the difference, although it's, uh, although it's not very clear, I think it's, it's, it's an important difference between the partitioning algorithm and the partitioning enforcement uh, scheme. So I'll, I'll, I'll describe that uh, in the next few slides. Uh, but before that, I mean, I have some interesting points here. Right? So here I said goals, high performance, high fairness, both. Now, uh, so, so I, I put a question mark uh, next to both. So uh, can anyone? It's, it's just a discussion, so there's no, there's, it's not a real question. So what, what, what do you think about achieving both high performance and high fairness? So what, what could be one uh, uh, performance goal? Anyone? I mean, so from, so from this point onwards, right, uh, I mean, Onur will uh, kill me because I don't have slide numbers. Uh, but hopefully it doesn't show up on the, screen, on the, on the recording anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think I, I messed it up anyway. So there are only a few more slides. Right? So what is the time right now? 5.25. 5.25? So, oh, what is it? Oh, 5.25. So, uh, so if you guys want to leave quickly, then uh, you don't have to interact. But uh, as I said, there are only three more slides. So let's, let's keep the class going at least till 5.40 or something like that. Right? So, so well, so okay, let me ask the question again. What, 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 is, what could be one performance goal, right? So I let's say let's let's simplify the problem. Let's say I just have two cores, two applications running on each of the uh, one application running on each core. So uh, what could be? So with, with with a single application, it's clear, right? So if I just have one application running in the system, performance is just make this application run as fast as possible, right? Clear uh, performance goal there. Uh, now two applications running in the system, what is? Uh, so if I, if I say uh, make both applications run as fast as possible, that's not useful because now that's not a clear metric. So what, what, what is a clear metric there? Yes, okay, one, one second. So before, before I uh, go into, so let, let's say we use uh, IPC 
as a performance metric for a single application, right? So for a single application, how many instructions do I run? They actually run uh, per cycle. That's let's say a performance metric for a single core system. So what could be a performance metric for a multi-core system? Yeah. Uh, I was going to say uh, on basically the same thing, which is for multi-core systems, um, minimize the cumulative stall time to, to memory. Basically, uh, imp improve IPC for, for both cores. Okay, so it's kind of you can just add up the IPCs of all the systems, right? So let's say I have two applications running. I just take uh, the IPC of the first application. I take the IPC of the second application. I just add them together, right? So that's that's one clear performance goal. Uh, uh, any, any, anything else? Uh, there is this. Uh, how many of you know about the weighted speed up metric? Okay, not many. I, I think I think it. it uh, so maybe maybe we should have a small uh, board discussion on uh, metrics because I mean these things will be useful for your projects as well. So what is so uh, so. Again, uh, people have studied metrics, so, so it's, I mean, it's, it's clear that, uh, I mean, just coming up uh, with some metric is, uh, uh, may not be very useful, uh, uh, or, I mean, it's, it's not straightforward to come up with a metric for performance in this case, right? So the problem really is, so now you have two applications, uh, uh, you, it's not clear how to combine the performance of both applications or how to uh, think about the performance of both applications uh, together, and one suggestion was to use, uh, the sum of the IPCs of both the applications, right? And what is it, so? What is the problem with that metric? Anyone? It's okay. You can answer. Metric. Uh, metric. Exactly, right? So uh, again, uh, I mean, the, so uh, remember the reason for having these metrics is to uh, compare different policies, right? Uh, so I don't, I'm not going to say, oh, my IPC is uh, two. If I just say my IPC is two, uh, is it good, is it bad? It's not clear. But if I say, oh, my IPC is two, and uh, there's this baseline scheme whose, whose IPC is 0 0.5, now someone says, oh, okay, your mechanism is good, right? So the idea behind using these metrics is to compare uh, different approaches. And the problem with using uh, some of the IPCs is that I can game the metric, right? I can say, okay, uh, let's say uh, mechanism one, uh, so, uh, so there is also this potential uh, IPC that I can get, right? So let's say there is uh, application uh, app one, app two, Right, so uh, running alone. Let's say uh, app one gets an IPC of uh, uh, three. App two gets an IPC of 0.2. Right, let's say, I mean, let's say it just always misses in the cache. It's just going to main memory uh, 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 always and therefore its IPC is very low. On the other hand, let's say this guy has a lot of cache hits and uh, so its IPC is uh, very high. Now let's say I used uh, mechanism, so I don't want to say LRU, I'll just say mechanism, uh, me mechanism one, right? Mechanism one did something like free for all or something like that, and uh, uh, app two just evicted all of the working set of app one from the cache. Uh, that anyway goes to memory only, so let's say this guy was still at point two, or let's say point one nine, slightly slowed down. App one got something like point five. Big hit, right? Now, uh, Maybe a bad example. Maybe a bad example. Why? So let's say this guy became 0 0.10, 0 0.1, right? Because uh, let's say he did have some a few caches. I think I went ahead of myself. So let's say let's say then let's look at mechanism two, which is trying to improve this sum of IPC metrics, right? So it's trying to improve uh, uh, the sum of the IPCs of all the applications. And what this mechanism is going to do is it's going to take app one and give all the cache space to app one. Right? No cache space for application two. So uh, app one kind, kind of gets its max uh, IPC. App two, uh, I mean, in this case, it, it got some cache space. So it, it, it was able to achieve 0.1. And in this case, it just was, let's say, terribly slowed down. Let's say, say 0.5. Now, if you look at the sum, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Say 0.05. Right? So if you look at the sum IPC metric, 
Uh, clearly, me mechanism two is better than mechanism one. But what is the problem here? So, uh, so both both mechanisms uh, are uh, there is there's, there's this unfairness issue in both mechanisms. But if you look at mechanism two, it won on this performance metric because it gave all space to application one, no space to application two. So this guy is slowed down by 4x, whereas this guy is not slowed down at all, right? So uh, again, uh, I mean there have been uh, papers which which have observed uh, problems with these metrics when they have proposed uh, other metrics. And as Jamie mentioned, one of the metrics is uh, weighted speed up, which, which is uh, most uh, widely used uh, in many uh, papers that examine multi-core performance. And the, and, the, and the idea behind weighted speed up metric is to uh, look at uh, the ratio of uh, the performance of different applications. So really what you want to uh, do is take into account the slowdown of each application, right? So if you look at, uh, compared to the baseline when they're running alone, uh, this application is slowed down by, so this mechanism slows down things by 1x, this guy is slowed down by 4x, right? So in this case, if you look at it, mechanism 1 uh, uh, slows down this guy by 6x, this guy by 2x, right? Now, uh, uh, the weighted speed of metric uh, takes into account these slowdowns instead of, I don't want to go into the exact metric here, but uh, it takes into account the slowdowns of all the applications rather than just looking at uh, IPC, uh, which is clearly a flaw, okay? So what could be some uh, uh, fairness metrics? Minimum slowdown. Uh, minimum slowdown? Yeah, sorry, maximum slowdown. Maximum slowdown, okay. Uh, yeah. No, so that's a, that's a mechanism. Yes. I'm talking about a metric. So let's say, let's say I had a mechanism, a third mechanism, right? Uh, which uh, slow down application one by 10x, and also slow down application two by 10x. It seems seems like it's fair. I mean, it's slowing down both applications uh, equally. So, but but is that a good metric? As in, I mean, or, or is that a good mechanism for fairness? Let's say all I care about was fairness. I don't care about uh, uh, individual application performance. So, is is that, is that a good metric? Okay, looks like that's going to take some time to come up again. Oh no, it did. Okay. Okay, so again, so there's a problem with this metric. Uh, the problem is you don't, uh, uh, I mean, you cannot just say uh, all applications should be equally slowed down. So instead, you also want to, uh, you want to ensure that the individual applications slow down are uh, same, at the same time reduce the maximum uh, slowdown, right? So that's, that's, that's kind of, uh, so reduce, minimize maximum slowdown. So that's kind of one uh, fairness objective. And uh, I mean, it's clear why uh, having both uh, may be an issue here, right? Because it's, I mean, even, even for a single metric, it's not, even for a single goal, it's not clear what's a good metric. So uh, metrics that take into account both fairness and uh, performance, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's in fact an open uh, area of research, I would say. And if you can think of a really good metric for both performance and fairness, you can actually uh, get a paper published or something like that, right? So, okay. So getting into uh, uh, cash partitioning again, right? So you can have different goals and Prior, uh, there, are, there have been a lot of prior approaches which have proposed different partitioning schemes uh, with the goal of both improving performance and fairness. And I think yesterday, uh, Gennady mentioned uh, uh, utility-based uh, cache partitioning. Uh, uh, again, the, goals, the goal of utility-based cache partitioning, again, it's only just animated, right? So it's, it's a way-based uh, partitioning scheme. Uh, and uh, the idea was to give more cache space to applications that uh, received more benefit uh, from the cache space. Right, and uh, I mean, do, do you guys remember uh, the mechanism, everything, or should I quickly go through them? Probably not, right? Anyway, so again, uh, some problems with uh, uh, way-based partitioning in general is if you have more cores than uh, you have ways, it's not clear how you can partition uh, the ways into the cores, right? So that, that's one main problem, that's a scalability issue of uh, uh, UCP. And there's this other issue, uh, which, is very, which, is, which is more subtle, right? Uh, now each, tag entry in your cache should have a core ID attached to it, right? Because if you look at uh, the enforcement policy of UCP, the way UCP is enforced is uh, you know what the partitioning algorithm is. And uh, in each set, let's say I have two cores. In each set, you know how many ways are occupied by core one, how many ways are occupied by core two, and you know what the target uh, partitioning is. 
And if each, if, if one of the cores is having more, uh, uh, occupying more space than uh, needed, then you evict the block of that core, right? So, so you clearly need a, a core ID uh, to uh, enforce the partitioning algorithm of UCP, right? So there is a, so there is this work called uh, Promotion Insertion Pseudo Partitioning. It was published in its uh, uh, 2009, uh, and the idea there was it, it, it used the same partitioning algorithm as UCP, right? So it still used uh, utility to determine how much cache space should be given to each uh, application. However, its enforcement policy was different, right? So it actually modified the uh, cache insertion policy and the promotion policy to kind of uh, not strictly partition the cache, but in a partition in a pseudo uh, manner. Uh, and that's why they call it pseudo partitioning. So, um, so let, let me quickly describe you on board what the insertion policy of uh, PAPP, as they call this paper was, and uh, what, what this probabilistic promotion algorithm was. So the, the idea was very simple. Uh, let's say I had, uh, uh, let, let's say this is a single uh, set, and uh, I had uh, eight ways uh, in the cache. And let's say I had two applications uh, sharing uh, the set, and uh, one application was allocated five ways, and another application was allocated three ways. And the way you would determine that is using uh, the algorithm of UCP, and the way PAPP uh, achieved uh, the partitioning scheme was it said, okay, so there is application A which takes uh, five ways, and application B which takes uh, three ways, right? So what you do is, when application A inserts a block, you insert at the fifth position, right? So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? You insert its block at the fifth position, and when application B uh, uh, inserts a block, you insert at the third position. And this was, this was the cache insertion policy, right? So you look at the number of ways allocated for an application, and depending on how many ways were allocated, you insert the blocks in the corresponding uh, location from the uh, LRU, right? And uh, the promotion policy was on a cache hit, uh, you don't promote it to uh, the MRU position, you promote it by one step, and you do that uh, probabilistically. With a, with a high probability you promote it, with a pro low probability, you just leave it in the same state, right? Now, uh, I mean, it's not immediately clear to me uh, why. So, th what the paper claimed was, uh, if you use these, uh, if you do, if you use this insertion and promotion policy, uh, your cache will be mostly partitioned in a way that uh, A gets five ways and B gets three ways. That was their claim, and uh, that was. I, I I don't think the paper had any. Uh, theoretical study or uh, 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 validation of this particular claim, uh, but this was, their, uh, this was their enforcement policy. And I mean, the reason why I brought this up was, I mean, remember a, uh, a couple of slides ago I told the partitioning uh, policy is uh, different from the partitioning enforcement scheme. So uh, uh, as you can see, the benefit of uh, PAPP's insertion policy is now you no, no longer need to keep track of core IDs in your uh, tag, right? So uh, really, all you care about is, I mean, so in UCP, you enforce the policy using the replacement policy. So when you want to replace a block of a specific application, you need to know which application, uh, so which application's block you're evicting. Uh, therefore, you need uh, the core ID to be there in the tags. But here, because you are enforcing it using the insertion and the promotion policy, remember that uh, both the insertion and promotion policies kick in uh, on an access, right? So when you access a block, uh, when a block gets accessed, uh, if it's a miss, you insert. If it's a hit, you promote. But you know which application accessed that block, right? So both these policies come with the core ID. So you know which core is accessing uh, the block. So uh, you don't need uh, the, tag, the core IDs to be attached to the tags. So that was the key benefit of uh, uh, PAPP. And apart from that, they also claim that, uh, I mean, this, such a mechanism does not strictly partition the cache. So there may also be some benefit for uh, uh, some loose partitioning. I mean, even though uh, uh, UCP may say, okay, give uh, application A five ways and application B four way, uh, three ways, there might be some sets for which application A may actually need fewer ways, right? So there is this, uh, uh, all sets 
may not be accessed in a similar fashion by all applications, right? So uh, they said there's some there's some benefit to uh, this loose partitioning as well. So that was that was promotion insertion pseudo uh, partitioning. Okay, and uh, so both UCP and PAPP are both hardware partitioning schemes, right? So you 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 have a goal and uh, uh, you partition the cache uh, in hardware. So the hardware has monitors to keep track of the utility of different applications, and then you partition the cache based on what uh, uh, the utility is. And uh, uh, prior work has proposed uh, software-based partitioning as well. So uh, how, how, how do you partition the cache using software? Any ideas? We'll be we'll be uh, done with the next slide. I can assure you that. Cool. Okay. So how many of you know about page coloring? Okay. So let's let's look at this, right? So the goal is to partition the cache using uh, uh, software, right? I, I don't want to use hardware. And uh, is it is it possible in today's systems? Uh, I would say yes, if if you understand how cache indexing and everything works. So let's look at page coloring, right? Oh, dude, this should be almost like oh. <laughs> so clearly, uh, clearly. Uh, okay, this is the idea behind page coloring, right? So in, so uh, most modern systems employ uh, virtual memory. So you have uh, the applications access the virtual page, the virtual. Uh, uh, the data in the virtual address space, the operating system, which is software, remaps uh, the virtual pages to physical pages, right? And this is the physical address. And in most processors, uh, the cache, the last level cache is both physically indexed and physically tagged, right? So you use the physical address to both index and uh, tag the cache. So this guy here is actually the physical address, right? Now, uh, as you can see, so you have the block offset, you have the cache index, you have the tag here, and you have the page offset and the uh, physical page number here. Now notice that the physical page number is under the control of the operating system, right? Now you can see that there is this overlap, right? Between the physical page number and the cache index. Now as you can see, by uh, modifying these four bits of the physical page number, I can, I can determine which cache index or which set a particular piece of data maps to. Right? Again, this is assuming that uh, this is how cache indexing uh, operates. Right? So there have been uh, other proposals which modify the cache indexing algorithm. I can probably uh, talk, talk to you guys about that uh, in, a, in, a, in a couple of minutes. But uh, this is the key idea behind these approaches. Right? So the operating system, uh, now let's say there is, uh, so, let's say, let's, so these, these few bits is what uh, uh, they call as the page coloring bits. Right? So if I say, okay, let's say, let's say there were two bits here which means uh, I have four different colors, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now, uh, if I had four applications, now the operating system is going to say, OK, I'm going to give color 1 to application 1, color 2 to application 2, 3 to application 3, and color 4 to application 4. As you can see, now the cache is also partitioned, right? So the set is also partitioned into four different colors. Now, there are a few sets which are color 0. There are a few sets color 1. So there is no overlap between these things. As can, now the cache is actually partitioned between all the applications, right? By ensuring that I map the data of uh, an application only to color one pages, I have also ensured that uh, those pieces of data will go only to color one sets, right? Now uh, I just explained it with the two uh, bits here, but you can imagine that there might be more bits here, uh, 16 colors or 32 colors, and uh, now the operating system has more control of how many colors to assign uh, to a particular application uh, depending on its needs uh, and things like that. So this is how you would partition the cache using operating system, right? Now, uh, this is a partitioning enforcement scheme, right? So once I know how much cache space I need to allocate for uh, a particular application, I can actually go and use this to determine how many colors should I uh, allocate for uh, a particular application. Uh, now there's this other question of how does the operating system know what is a good partitioning between applications, right, in, 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 in runtime? So again, there have been, so these, the, 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 the two papers here, uh, I think, I think, uh, uh, more, more the first paper. I, I, I'm really not sure what the second paper is here. 
I just copied these things from uh, one of the slides, but I know the first favor. So the idea there was to uh, use uh, performance counters uh, from the hardware, like cache miss rate and things like that, to determine uh, what a best partitioning scheme is. So you you try a, a particular, so you divide execution into epochs, you try different partitioning schemes uh, in different epochs, and then find out oh, what is the best partitioning that, is, that works right now. And then you follow that for a few epochs, and then you go relearn uh, the whole thing to accommodate phase changes and things like that. So that was the uh, idea here, right? So now it's, it's, it's really, uh, that's it. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to, uh, 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 I mean, I just mentioned, uh, I'll talk about, uh, what was it? Set imbalance, right? Different sets, Wait, what was it? What was it? Oh, indexing, right? Yeah, cache indexing. So uh, what might be a reason to modify the cache indexing algorithm? Right? So in this case, it's clear, right? I mean, I, so if this is the physical address, uh, I know uh, the block offset I cannot change. Uh, but this whole part of physical address, I can choose any, any bits to uh, uh, determine my cache index. Now, uh, in this particular example, I've shown, okay, these bits are going to determine cache index, right? Now, uh, I can statically choose different bits, or I can randomize index. What are, what are, some, what, what are some benefits of choosing the cache index like this? Okay. So uh, you will have. A you kind of distribute the data across uh, uh, the cache. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, that's a good point. <laughs> but I would assume that 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 would be true. Uh, uh, that may be true for uh, uh, a different indexing. So I, I can I can choose a, I can choose an indexing scheme where uh, I choose these few bits and let's say these few bits for a cache indexing. You see what I'm saying? I can I can. So there is no reason for having uh, the index bits in a contiguous, uh, contiguous locations, right? I can split the cache index into two parts, and I have few bits here and few bits here. Now, uh, what are some advantages of doing this? So you mean this, you mean using lower order bits uh, to, to select what set? Yeah, I mean, just using index in this fashion. Okay, I mean, I'll just, so it's, 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 it's simple, right? It's dead simple, right? I mean, I don't have to do anything fancy to obtain the index. Uh, I can choose other bits uh, from, the, from, from the cache. I mean, th those, those will also be uh, simple indexing algorithms. Uh, so, so what, what you, yeah. Keep. Uh, okay. So uh, if you use uh, the, those higher order bits for indexing, everyone will try to go to the same index from bigger address perspective. Okay. So that's a that's a good point. So what he's mentioning is okay. If uh, if my data structure, so let's say assume I'm accessing a, 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 a let's say I'm just accessing a one kilobyte data structure, and uh, I use the top few bits to uh, index into the cache. Now uh, it's likely that the top few bits. Uh, are going to be the same for the one kilobyte data structure that I'm accessing, right? So uh, every single block in that one kilobyte data structure are going, is going to map to the same set. As a result, it's going to lead to thrashing, right? Because I mean, the one kilobyte may not fit into a single set of the cache. On the other hand, if you choose the index bits in this fashion, the one kilobyte data structure is actually spread out across all the sets, so it may not lead to uh, thrashing, right? So, so that's that's a good point. So, so choosing the index as a lower order bits has uh, that benefit. Uh, but again, what prior work has uh, uh, found was, uh, it's not always the case. Right? It's not always the case that, so it's, it's, it's not a, a, a great mechanism to uh, uh, prevent the problem. So that problem is, is what is called the set imbalance problem. Right? So there are many sets in the cache, a few sets are uh, uh, overutilized, and since they have a lot of conflict misses, whereas there are other sets which are underutilized. There are, there are very few uh, blocks that are uh, used in the sets, and the remaining blocks are never reused. Now, clearly, there's a problem here, right? So you want to kind of balance the whole thing uh, so that all sets are equally uh, utilized. And th this, this is a set imbalance problem. And uh, uh, one mechanism that prior work has suggested to avoid this problem is to randomize the index, right? So what I'm going to do is 
I'm not going to choose any of these bits to uh, use uh, determine the index. I'm just going to use a hash function, right? So I'll, uh, as soon as uh, I receive the cache block address, I'll pass it through a hash function. The hash function is going to spit out uh, an index, and I'll use that index, right? Now, uh, it, that, that that scheme works. I mean, it'll saw it'll likely address the set imbalance problem because you have randomized the index. There is uh, uh, no specific pattern. Uh, any any specific pattern may not. Uh, uh, map to the same sets, right? So it, it likely that things are going to be distributed across the cache. Uh, so, but what, what, so what is the problem with randomizing the index, right? As a as a so I was I was always wondering, okay, index randomization is kind of a very uh, uh, simple algorithm that people can employ. I mean, there is no reason for people to not employ index randomization if it actually addresses the set imbalance problem. But it turns out that uh, Hardware manufacturers actually don't use index randomization, and uh, this is the this is the reason that I got. Yeah. So uh, if you do every time you get an address, you have to pass it through the hash function. Okay. So with this scheme, you can uh, parallelize the thing. So when, uh, you can like send uh, you know what bits are going to be the index bits. Okay. So you can go there and. Uh, try to so that is one problem, right? So with uh, if you if you actually want to randomize the index, you have to pass it through this hash function. So that's going to increase the latency of your cache hit, right? So uh, to actually go and check if a block is present in the cache or not, I have to uh, compute this hash function. But in this case, it's just the it's just the few uh, it's just a few uh, bits in the uh, cache address. So I don't have to do any do any fancy computations. But even assuming, let's say that uh, hash function computation takes just one cycle or uh, two cycles, and my cache access latency is uh, 40 cycles. Uh, the uh, the benefit of actually doing the index randomization may be more uh, than uh, this additional latency. Turns out that cache coherence uh, is a is a is a bigger problem, right? So how does index randomization uh, how how can index randomization possibly uh, or cache indexing possibly affect coherence? Any thoughts? I mean, I so this is the answer that I got. Uh, people don't do randomization because it affects coherence. Uh, and I thought about it for a uh, bit, and then I realized how it can possibly affect coherence. I still don't know the exact answer, but uh, uh, can anyone uh, throw in some thoughts? How can, why, why would index random or, or in the cache indexing function actually affect coherence? I mean, again, I'll, I'll be upfront, I don't know the actual answer, I just have some thoughts. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll just I'll just throw in the thought that I that I have. As I said, I, I still don't know uh, if this is the right answer. What what I think is uh, so in uh, for for coherence, you have uh, a directory. Let's say let's say we are looking at directory based coherence. I'm I'm not sure how it's how it actually affects snoop based coherence. But let's assume that we have a, a directory based coherence. Uh, you have this last level cache which also acts as the directory. And uh, uh, when you have an indexing function like this. You can say, if a block is in this particular set in the last level cache, it is likely to be in one of these two sets in, the, in, a, in a lower level cache. Right? So uh, actually, you can have uh, the inclusion. inclusion. So how, do you guys know about cache inclusion, exclusion, uh, those concepts? OK. So I can extend the cache inclusion and exclusion property to actually sets instead of the whole cache. Right? Instead of saying, OK, if a block is present uh, in, in, the, in the cache, it is also present in the lower level cache. That's uh, that's an inclusive cache property, right? Now I can actually extend it to uh, individual sets, saying if a block is present uh, in a in a lower level cache in this particular set, then it it should be present in this particular set in the last level cache or something like that, right? Now, uh, I mean, cache coherence is cache coherence protocols are really complex. Right? I mean, it, uh, although the problem may uh, seem simple at first start, uh, uh, I mean, managing uh, uh, and agents who are trying to communicate in a distributed manner is a, is a really hard problem, right? Uh, have you, I mean, have you guys, uh, I, I would suggest you guys go and read uh, some of uh, Leslie Lamport's paper uh, on uh, distributed uh, uh, coherence and distributed management. He has done a lot of work on that. And uh, they, they are, they're actually really complex. And going and implementing one of these algorithms in hardware is even more complex, right? And uh, any simplicity that uh, your uh, cache indexing function uh, may provide to the cache coherence protocol is a big win. 
right? And you don't want to avoid uh, such, such uh, the complexity uh, issues uh, by, uh, you don't want to introduce complexity issues by just modifying the index, uh, randomizing the index or something like that, right? So having said that, index randomization is one way to uh, address the uh, set uh, imbalance problem. There have been other prior works which uh, address set, the set imbalance problem. The, the, so if you guys are interested, there is this idea called the set balancing cache. And so, uh, and uh, there is a dynamic set balancing cache. I think that was also proposed by the same paper. And uh, uh, there are a few follow up papers called uh, STEM, which uh, incorporated bimodal insertion policy into the set balancing cache and uh, things like that, right? So uh, if, if you guys are interested, you should go and look at it. So yeah, so the indexing uh, is actually, it's actually more complicated than uh, uh, I thought it was, I mean, right? So anyway, so it's really, that's it. So uh, yeah, nice talking to you guys. Yeah, hope uh, you enjoyed the uh, lecture. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. So I think I think it's just uh, it's 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 just a uh, uh, I mean habit, right? I mean, so let's say, I mean, LRU is I mean, even even though uh, it may not be the best policy around, uh, it's one of the. Uh, policies that, that, that works really well for many applications. I mean, in fact, uh, I mean, that's, that's really the reason why we had the dueling EAF in the first place, right? I mean, there are some applications for which LRU just beats any other algorithm that may have been proposed, right? So, uh, right, so they just call, I mean, they, they even call such, such, such applications LRU-friendly applications, right? So, I mean, so I think, I think it's, it's just a habit and uh, being fair to uh, a policy that has worked for such a long time, right? I mean, any any even pay, paging, uh, not just cache replacement, even in paging. I mean, people have shown people have shown theoretical results about LRU, right? Uh, comparing it to the optimal algorithm, there's a I think there's a theoretical result which says uh, LRU does not perform. Uh, so if uh, so, this is opt, and this is LRU, and uh, uh, so opt with uh, x amount of cache space, uh, if it performs, uh, if, it, if it gives you some uh, uh, cache miss rate, then uh, LRU with uh, 2x the cache space will not perform. So if it's okay, it, okay, so 2x. If this, if this gives m misses, this will be less than 2m misses. That was, the, that was the idea. I mean, it kind of seems, does not seem to be a very great result, uh, but I mean, it's, it's still a theoretical guarantee, right? So uh, if you have opt, again, again, opt works only for a single, I mean, in a sense, a single access sequence, right? I mean, if you have a specific access sequence, then you know what opt is. And uh, if opt gives you m misses with x cache space, LRU won't give you more than two m misses with two x cache space. This is a, this is a theoretical result. So and actually, there's a, a paper called uh, Shepherd Cache. I forget. Uh, this was from uh, the Indian Institute of Sciences uh, in Bangalore. Uh, the, 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 the Shepherd Cache actually proposed to use, exploit this particular concept, right? So if you, if you look at clearly what this guy says is, uh, I mean, if you have a 2x cache space and LRU gives you, after 2m misses, uh, opt will actually perform with half the cache size, right? Uh, in, in fact, opt will perform better with half the cache size. And they actually performed this study where uh, you, you use uh, the LRU policy with whatever cache space you have, and you run opt with uh, half the cache size, and they found that in many cases opt actually outperforms LRU. Now, uh, if that is really the case, uh, can you do something like this? Right. So their, their idea was very simple. So if if I had eight ways in my cache, can I can I just split the cache into two parts? And uh, uh, so this part I used to do some kind of learning. And this part, I'll use it to emulate up, right? So as you can see, I mean, if I if if I if I do a very good job of uh, emulating up by whatever learning I do here, uh, I mean, and I'm actually perform outperform LRU, right? So that was that was Shepard Cache, right? Yeah. So. Okay.